Hey, 4C Divers! Welcome! It is Wednesday. It is August 12th, 2020, and we are happy to uh, have you guys back here at our Facebook Live events. Um, hopefully everybody is doing well, everyone's staying healthy, everyone's staying happy and sane. Hopefully you're out there diving. It has been gorgeous, the conditions. Flat, calm seas, warm water, great visibility. Even up at the dive uh, at the Blue Heron Bridge, it's been fantastic. So if you aren't down here in South Florida diving, I'm not sure what you're doing, but this is this is the time to dive. So make sure you give us a call. We'll get you out there. We'll get you diving. If you're not a diver, that's fine. We can get you certified. No problem. Just give us a call. But uh, let's check in and make sure uh, everybody's here. So if you are tuning in, please give us a little comment below saying uh, hello and where you're listening in from. Uh, you can also give us the uh, thumbs up emoji, the smiley face, or the little heart emoji that lets us know that you are enjoying our presentation tonight. So a couple of things. Uh, it is August. Uh, this is the time um, that we put our camera accessories on sale um, at the stores. And so you can go straight to the store or you can shop online. And I'll give you guys that link in just a second in the comment section. And you guys can uh, check out and see what we have uh, that we're offering for the month of August. And also, it is uh, the time frame when the big Goliath groupers, they come in and they start aggregating here in the Palm Beach County area on the wrecks and the reefs. Uh, some of the wrecks that you see them on, they can have anywhere from 30 to 40 of these big Goliath groupers. And it is such a great way to explore your camera because these guys are so photographic and so we usually that's why we pair our um august with our goliath groupers and our photography so you guys can uh get out there and get some photos of these big fellas and fellers fellas and fellers <laughs> anyways all right we're all saying hello hi everybody thank you for tuning in again um some housekeeping if you go to the um, Eventbrite link that we had for this event and register by seven o'clock. Uh, that's when it shuts off and we are going to be raffling off the Patty digital underwater photography manual. Okay. And, uh, you can use this to take a class with one of our photo pros that we have here at 4C. So if you're interested in more learning, that is the best way to Go, you can kind of get a one-on-one -on -one with someone and if you already have a camera they really hone in and help you figure out the camera that you have don't have a camera yet that's not a problem we've got 4c photo pros that can help you if you're not into doing photography but like to have pictures of yourself underwater no problem uh, we have photo pros that will go diving with you it's just like hiring a dive guide it's a, a dive guide with a photography uh, pro so they'll take pictures of you as you swim along the wrecks and reefs along South Florida so uh, again, like I said, if you're enjoying this presentation, give us that thumbs up, give us that heart emoji or that smiley face and let us know you're enjoying it. You can also um, write comments during the presentation. If you have any questions about photography and what um, our guest presenter is talking about, go ahead and write them. We'll try and get them answered um, for you by the end. And if not, then we'll type in the, uh, the answer for you. So awesome, guys. Well, I want to introduce to you one of our newest 4C photo pros. And I uh, actually had the joy of diving with um, this photo pro uh, before he actually got into photography. He saw me on the boat, Diversity, in Boca, and I had my camera rig, which I have it here. Ooh. And he started asking me questions about it, and I started talking about photography, and uh, the rest is history. He was hooked and he wanted to get into the business. So I'm going to let um, our guest presenter, this is Tim Sullivan. He's going to tell you a little bit about himself, how he got into photography. He's giving you a great presentation about um, how to get started in underwater photography, how to select your cameras, composition. All There's a bunch of great information tonight. So make sure you uh, stay, tape, uh, stay, stay tuned in this whole time. And at the end, we're going to do that raffle for the Underwater Digital Photography book. So make sure you register online before seven. All right, Tim, take it away. Cool. Cool. Thank you so much. Cole, thank you so much. I think thank you got the audio so worked out. I think you got the audio worked out. I think you got the audio worked out. 
Okay. Great, Nicole, thank you so much for that uh, great introduction. It was, uh, gosh, it must have been five, six years ago when we met, when I was just a tourist from New Jersey still. And uh, a lot has changed since then, and really excited to now be uh, 4C's newest uh, face, uh, 4C Photo Pro. And I'm uh, really excited to be here tonight talking with you guys about uh, underwater photography, some introductory stuff, um, how to get into it, some uh, things to consider when you're making a decision about getting into underwater photography, and uh, look forward to also answering questions afterwards. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to get right into this uh, presentation. Great. So point, shit, point, shoot, click, dive. Immerse yourself into imaging. This is actually a great local image taken uh, the Anna Cecilia, uh, right up there off of Palm Beach. A uh, really fun image I got to take. Um, you know, when the captain drops you just right and that current's running strong and you hit that wreck and you get this beautiful opportunity in Florida. These uh, photo opportunities are just amazing. Um, so say when I met Nicole, I still was just diving up in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. I just started diving in Florida when I had gotten into underwater photography. And uh, sure enough, I got to do a bunch of diving in Florida and then of course the Bahamas. Um, then I took an opportunity and I moved to Curacao and I actually worked as an underwater photographer for about a year there. Uh, got to do some more traveling, got to go to Bonaire, uh, ended up coming back to Florida just around three years ago now. Um, settled in and, and got myself a job at Reef Photo and Video where I sat uh, about two and a half years I spent a uh, really awesome experience there and learned so much about underwater photography and got to continue to travel, got to go to California, back to Bonaire, and then even to Indonesia and, and get to uh, learn from some really great underwater image makers uh, throughout the industry uh, from that role and got to learn a lot and also assist in teaching people and that's where I really um, knew that I loved teaching people and helping them get into underwater photography. And I really have been uh, trying to embrace that ever since. So that's just a little bit of background on me and why I'm here today. And uh, also very grateful for the relationship that I was able to start with Nicole about five, six years ago that leads us here today to this uh, awesome, uh, awesome show. Cool. So yes, I do snorkel and scuba. Um, and that may be um, when you're thinking about this, when you're getting into underwater photography, of course, you could be doing either snorkeling or scuba or both, depending on what your preference is, your training level. Um, of course, the opportunities are different. Um, I like to take advantage of both when the when the situations see fit. So here's a really cool uh, black, and, black and white image taken in the keys. Um, something when a photo isn't quite perfect and uh, you need to, uh, you still want to share it, black and white is a great way to do so. So when we get into starting and thinking about um, deciding on underwater photography, first you need to narrow down your camera options, right? So maybe you have a camera already that you are using for different reasons. That could be a great camera to get started with. Uh, you need to think about your budget too, whether you have the budget to buy a, a new camera or a used camera. Uh, and then, of course, depending on your budget, will determine if you're looking at getting something maybe a little smaller or something more on the professional level. And that also would come down to determining what you want to achieve with your underwater photography. You know, if you want to take some really cool photos to be able to share with your friends and family, uh, you know, small censored cameras work really great for this. If you are thinking of wanting to print your art, uh, maybe even sell some or uh, print really large, you maybe want to consider getting a larger system, but there's a lot to consider about what you want to achieve uh, when getting into underwater photography. There's a lot of really great beginner solutions too. And maybe you already have some of those, like the GoPro, uh, Sea Life camera is also a wonderful way to get started in underwater photography because they have those complete systems, uh, really easy to operate without having to worry too much about the, the settings. Uh, so doing some proper research is also, I think, really important when you talk about uh, making a decision, if you're spending money on something, a hobby that you're gonna maybe do for the next several years or for the rest of your life, you don't, you don't know it first. Um, so do your proper research and ask questions and, and get more than one opinion. Um, that's always a good thing. But something also to consider when you start to learn and if you're learning from someone underwater photography, if you start learning from too many people, you may be getting conflicting information. So it's always good to when you're learning from someone to uh, try to focus on what they're teaching you before you learn from too many people at once. One other really important thing 
um, I always like to mention when people are talking about starting getting into underwater photography is think about their dive skills. Um, being a competent and uh, safe diver is really going to help you a lot when it comes to uh, having successful dives with achieving uh, images you're proud of and also images that don't have a negative impact on the other divers around you or the environment. So having good dive skills is really something to consider practicing, um, getting really um, up to speed on your dive skills and, and comfortable in the water. And that will help you a lot when you start bringing a camera underwater. On that note too, you know, smaller systems have their advantages over larger camera rigs. As you can see here, so you have a smaller rig here that is uh, something more of like a, uh, for a cell phone. Say so smaller systems also are easier to uh, travel with. Also can be uh, easier to get uh, certain subjects you need to get closer and a larger rig can uh, cause issues there. Go with the crowd. So of course, as you know, if you're just getting into underwater photography, um, there's so many people who are already involved and uh, there's some really great cameras and successful systems that work really well. And uh, going with what's popular can really be a good idea because these systems are tried and tested and true. Um, we'd always get questions about whether different lenses work. And uh, the different companies that make housings, they do a really good job of telling you what lenses work great and what lenses work okay and what ones maybe don't work so well at all for underwater. So going with tried and tested uh, solutions for underwater is a really great way to help with your success. Um, some people also like to be MacGyvers and uh, do it themselves and make their own rigs and, and be unique and different. And that's great too. But of course that comes with, uh, you wanna have a little more ingenuity in those cases. You would wanna consider where you're gonna dive. Um, if you're gonna travel a lot, you definitely wanna keep that in mind of how big your camera system is. Whether you have uh, strobes, whether you use video lights, focus lights, the different accessories that you add to your system all make it much, much larger and heavier at the airport. Of course, underwater, you know, there's ways to make it not weigh too much. But of course, when you're at the airport, that is a big concern that underwater photographers always have to deal with and uh, something to consider if you know you're going to travel a lot and you know the airlines are not going to be so friendly with your overweight bags. Of course, think about your goals that you want to achieve. If you set realistic goals and, uh, and then a very good chance you'll be able to achieve them um, with the proper equipment. Uh, there's definitely great ways to figure out what your goals may be. Um, you can always help with determining you know, what the best solution is, whether, you, uh, whether you're thinking about going more of a professional route to be able to uh, sell images or more just a point and shoot route or sharing social media content. And uh, so if you think about your goals and the types of photos you want to achieve, uh, that's always a great thing to do when, uh, when starting into this sport. Now, of course, you want to get creative. Now that you have a camera, you're going to take it in. Um, you know, the best thing to do is, of course, get comfortable with it, learn your camera so you understand the settings. When you understand the settings, then you can truly start to get creative um, because now you're underwater, you're multitasking, you're paying attention to your dive buddy, you're paying attention to the dive guide, um, you're trying to make sure you uh, keep your camera rig with you, and then you also want to take a really nice photo. So there's a lot of multitasking that goes on. So as your dive skills improve and you start to get truly competent with your system, then you can start to get creative and think about things like composition, proper lighting, um, getting closer. That is always something that matters. As you can see, I got pretty close here to this subject. Um, and uh, getting closer is always gonna help with getting the best detail in your images. It's just the way that the, the light travels through water. You wanna get close and then you wanna get closer. And it's always the first two rules of underwater photography is to get close and get closer. You may see different shapes. Uh, of course, when you're diving, I love diving on the wrecks and I kind of like getting into the geometry of that. And so you may find different unique shapes. Um, when you talk about uh, finding your background, this is uh, something to consider. You notice a lot of uh, people that are new to underwater photography will um, not consider that pointing your camera down is uh, not very appealing when the when the photo is looked at. 
So it's always a really good thing to think about is what is your background going to look like for your photo? And the best backgrounds underwater are generally always going to be water themselves. Uh, water backgrounds are much more appealing than rubble backgrounds or straight down shots. Uh, there's a few straight down underwater shots that work really well. Uh, but those are very selective shots. In general, you always want to have blue behind you. As you see with this image, you get low and find your background, and then you can you know, use your leading lines, your rule of third, and truly start to create something that can be considered a piece of art. I say rule of thirds. This is something that applies to so many things other than just photography in your everyday life. Um, you deal with this everywhere you go. Um, it's just uh, subliminally, uh, groups of three are always better. So uh, as you can see here in this frame, um, this is the, the grid marks there. And you can see the subject is uh, there on the third of the frame. And uh, that's just a simple, um, you know, simple rule. It helps with uh, creating more appealing images when you're thinking about the rule of thirds and not placing the focal point in the center of your frame and moving it out to, as you can see, the grid pattern here. And almost all cameras will have this and other versions of it that you can use to help you when you're trying to create your, com your composed shot underwater. Leading lines. Uh, this is a really uh, key fundamental with, uh, with compositions, especially with rec photography. As you can see here, the leading line uh, leads you from the, uh, the top right back to the bottom left to the diver. Uh, and the leading line takes you past the barracuda and also the, the feature on the wreck. So a great example of a leading line taking you through to your primary subject. And now, of course, the big question. People get started in underwater photography. They get concerned that their system is going to be too big. And at first, they are just want to take some photos. And adding light is considered uh, um, you know, the next step. Um, so when you get started, people will generally sometimes say, we'll hold off on strobes. Maybe it wasn't in their budget right away, or maybe they just wanted to start simple. Uh, but of course, as you move on, a lot of scuba divers will always end up wanting to add light. And that is because we're just, we're going deeper. Uh, as you go deeper, the light just disappears. And to bring out those proper true colors and contrast and sharpness in your image that you want, adding light is the best way to do that. And there's a, there's a couple different ways to do it. Of course, you have uh, constant light, which could be known as focus lights or video lights, depending on how strong they are. And then you have strobes. And then you have many different options in size and brand and power of how strong those strobes are, how they work, whether they're more universal or more specific to a certain brand. And uh, it's definitely considered a fundamental in underwater photography to have um, to have some strobe lit images. A lot of people do like to do ambient light, especially free divers. Uh, and in the Bahamas, that's really great. And the free diving is uh, really uh, really special there because the sun is so bright, you can you can achieve these great images without strobes. But for the most part, when we're scuba diving, and especially with macro photography, um, to add the light, it's just required. With wide angle, you do have more opportunity to have ambient light. Uh, but with macro, of course, uh, strobes become truly essential. And then as you get more advanced, of course, you can start venturing into night diving with your camera. And then black water diving, the, you know, the options are endless once you, once you get involved. All right, so let's talk about some more stuff. So of course you talk about the equipment choices. There's a lot of really great brands um, to choose from. When you get started, uh, GoPro is generally the most popular beginner system. It's what I started on. It's what a lot of people start on. And there's a lot of great ways to uh, add a tray, add some lights, and do some really special stuff with GoPro. Uh, sea Life also is great for uh, getting an all-in-one bundled system. And then, of course, you get into some compact cameras, and Fantasy makes some really great housings, too. And I think we're actually going to see if Nicole is ready for us for some questions so we can start seeing what you guys want to talk about. Okay. 
Okay, Nicole's going to come on to my screen. All right, so Mike Green wants to know, hey, Tim, um, do you have any previous um, background in photography, land, like land photography, before you did underwater? Because um, he wants to know if that'll help shorten the curve, learning curve of, you know, learning underwater photography. What do you have uh, to say about that? Great. Oh, thanks, Nicole. Thank you, Mike, for the question. Um, so my previous uh, photography background was amateur. Um, I was uh, in middle school and actually still using film. And I, it was a, a hobby of mine, but it was never um, much more than that. But it was a hobby. I was always the, the kid who had a camera. Um, and then from there, as I got into diving, um, underwater photography really came back to me through the GoPro in wanting to share with uh, you know my friends and family what I'm seeing down there. Um, from that point, it really it started to take off. Um, my from that point, I really got all into diving and became my primary hobby, and then was expanding on that with adding all sorts of fun attachments to my GoPro. Um, from there, I started to do my training for professional diving, and I actually worked with uh, Olympus Cameras underwater rep uh, Bob Hahn up in Pennsylvania. I started to learn from him. And that was right before I moved to Curacao. Um, I moved to Curacao to do to take a job in tourism photography, but I had not much experience in that uh, field. But I had experience in sales, so that's where they were willing to train me. And uh, so I learned through practice, uh, through a year of diving, two to three dives a day, five to six days a week with a camera, taking pictures of people underwater. So my experience came through practical. Um, uh, hardship and training too is uh, also very challenging at first to learn how to photograph people underwater and then make the photos appealing enough that they had to buy the photos from me after. So it was a, a really fun challenge and a really great experience at a company called Turtle and Ray Productions in Curacao. And I spent almost a year there and uh, and that that's when I came back to Florida and was uh, very fortunate to be chosen uh, when Reef Photo was hiring. and. Uh, and then I truly immersed myself in underwater photography and videography and cinematography as, uh, and learned so much uh, from there as it was my full-time job to, to help people. And if I can add, um, obviously taking some photography courses on just basic things like learning what ISO means and what um, aperture and things like that, that's gonna help you so that when you get underwater, you're kind of more familiar with those terms and how your particular camera works because guess what? You're going to jump in and you're going to start seeing cool stuff. You're like, I want to take a picture of that. I want to take a picture of that. And you're like going all over the place and you're, you know, you want to make sure that you know what you're doing with your settings. So if you can practice with your camera back on land, mm -hmm. uh, you'll find that you'll uh, be a little bit more successful because I, so many times I see divers and they jump in and then they're like, here's the camera. Here. I'll move it so that's you can see. So here's their camera, right? And they're jumping in, and he, hi. <laughs> this obviously wasn't ready to demo. Here we go. Let's a little too loose. Okay. And then they all they do is they just stare at the back, and they're looking at their LCDs, and they're playing with their buttons. And there's that beautiful, you know, turtle swimming by, and they miss it. Um, so you know, again, getting practice on land, taking your camera, even if you put it in the housing. Take it on land and go shoot things around your house, around your backyard, and uh, you know you can get that practice. Mm -hmm. um, another thing too, uh, and I know you're going to talk about this, is uh, buoyancy. Mm -hmm. Buoyancy is the key to underwater photography, guys. For so many reasons. I mean, just when you think about not disturbing the critters at Blue Heron Bridge, uh, not silting up the sand, because that just causes more backscatter to be in your images. Um, being able to have proper buoyancy to compose a shot and, and even understand your breathing, uh, understanding that a little inhale, little exhale can make you go up and down just that right amount you want to get the proper composition on a shot. Because with wide angle photography, you don't get as many redos. You know, with macro, you, you have a lot more time with your subject, but sometimes with wide angle, you're t as Nicole said, the animal swims by and they don't come back. So you really want to have your settings ready and uh, being familiar with the camera helps a lot with that and having your buoyancy and your dive skills ready is key. Okay, so, so here's some more questions coming in. Uh, 
they want to know how do you make a jump from a GoPro on a selfie stick to an actual tray with maybe some lights or some strobes or something like that? How do you make that jump? Great. Yeah. So of course, um, right there, it just comes down to the first thing is the budget to do so because uh, the GoPro is the the lowest entry point uh, for underwater photography. So if you have the money, maybe you have to save for a couple months um, and you do the research and you decide on a camera, whether it be maybe a, a compact camera, a small mirrorless, or perhaps a entry level DSLR. Um, sometimes people come up with those opportunities because they are given a camera or inherit a camera. And that can be a great way to get started is by inheriting one. Um, but when you're actually making that, you know, that jump then comes down to um, taking some time to uh, understand the basics because uh, the GoPro is you don't need to understand much. You just, you know, hit the record button. Um, so when you start to understand shutter speed and how that affects your photos, understanding aperture and how that affects your depth of field, understanding ISO and what that does to your photos um, is going to be that core knowledge, those things, is what's going to help you get to that point where you're no longer creating GoPro um, screenshots and you're creating photos that you want to ship. Okay. So this next one, uh, it's a more specific question, but what's your opinion on the Olympus TG6? I know it has great macro capabilities, but not sure the picture quality will meet the criteria, especially for wide angle photography. Great. Thanks, Scott. Great question. Um, the Olympus TG line, you know, four, five, six, all of them, I've got to use a, a few of those. I think they're great. Um, they're a great primary camera for a lot of people. Um, they're also a great secondary camera for those that have larger full frame systems. Um, so in my experience, their built in macro mode is outstanding. It, it makes that camera the most popular underwater camera um, all around. Um, so for wide angle, yes, the lens out of the box is not that wide. However, there are several options for different wide angle ports. So what that is, and uh, this is actually great that you brought it up, um, the wide angle ports, they're called wet lenses, wet optics, and uh, what they do is they help correct the underwater distortions, they help bring back, um, they help uh, actually convert your camera to be wider in certain scenarios depending on which, which one, whether it's a dome or a lens or an optic. Um, but I've seen some great stuff done with the TG5 for wide angle. Um, if you're doing scuba diving, of course, you're going to want to have some good strobes it's for wide angle photography if you want to have some nice compositions. But also, maybe if you're in the Bahamas doing shallower stuff, um, then ambient light can be great too. Uh, but for the TG6, I've seen some really great stuff uh, for picture quality with wide angle. Um, you know, of course, you may not be able to print something, uh, you know, 30 by 30 by 40 on your wall, it might be a little too pixelated. Uh, and that's just because the sensor is a little small. But in terms of quality wide angle images, I think it is great, especially as an all around camera. Okay, awesome. My favorite question that is next, somebody wants to know tips for the backscatter. And also, <laughs> they want to know about where do I position my strobe. So <laughs> Tim, I actually brought you a whiteboard so, you can, so you can draw some uh, <laughs> Great. some diagrams. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, great. So I'll definitely draw some diagrams. We'll talk about some strobe positioning and eliminating backscatter. Um, but also to touch on that, something you do before I draw this crude image um, would be backscatter, of course, as we know, is the particulate in the water. And even in the most clear places like Grand Bahama, there is still going to be some backscatter in your image to, to some extent. Um, minimizing that is always the goal. So you're never going to say there's no backscatter, but it's minimizing it to the point where it's no longer noticeable or can be edited it out because maybe you only put, there's only a little bit left. So proper stroke positioning is really important and I'm going to draw that. Also buoyancy with not kicking up sand. So if you're kicking up a lot of sand, you're actually creating more backscatter. Um, so that is something that really helps a lot. Uh, muck stick, this for the, uh, Macro divers at the bridge. This is can be a really helpful tool in uh, stopping the backscatter. Um, also, if you dive at the bridge a lot, uh, diving when it's less crowded, that can be helpful too for reducing backscatter because it is it can be truly out of your control, especially if you want to do wide angle at the bridge. 
So Nicole's going to talk for a second while I draw because I cannot do two things at once. <laughs> awesome. So like he said, there's a thing called the muck sticks, if you didn't get to see that, okay? Um, and we sell these at 4C, and what you do is you use this to uh, position yourself in uh, the sand, or if you're on a rock or on a wreck, you can position yourself and then use your hands and kind of uh, be able to position and make sure you don't touch the wreck. The, the rack or whatever it is that's underneath you. Um, also, if you're stuck with like a current, what's easy is to just hold on to it for a second and uh, you're not gonna get blown away while you're trying to get the photography. Obviously, you know, talking about the buoyancy, guys, I mean, think about it. When you breathe in, you're going to rise. So, obviously your camera's coming with you. And then when you breathe out, right? So. Buoyancy, it's not just for your particular body and your VCD buoyancy, but also your camera. Depending on what camera system you have, you can add things to your camera to help you um, make it more neutral in the water. So um, because I'm constantly using my camera, I throw it around my body a lot, so I don't want it floating. So I don't have any floats on my camera, but you can add what are called um, arm floats to these uh, the, the camera um, arms here and that will help you so that it's uh, neutrally buoyant in the water so it's easier to use instead of it being super heavy and you're trying to hold it up and get your shot and it's just you're kicking and having a hard time with your buoyancy so floats um, can be added to any arms um, and uh, you can actually you know go in and talk to one of us and we can talk to you more about the different accessories that we have um, to help you make your camera really easy to use underwater. Um, that's obviously if you have a bigger rig. You, you probably don't need that for like something like a GoPro. But uh, you know, again, um, once you put hardware on here, it makes it heavier. Uh, a lot of people lose their cameras um, because they float. Most uh, like the plastic housings will actually float to the surface. So if you only have it connected to your arm with a, um, a lanyard, uh, a lot of times people aren't paying attention as they're swimming and whoop, it pops off your hand, it goes to the surface. So if that's the case, then you need to make sure you add some weight to the camera. So again, it's getting that neutral buoyancy of that camera. Oh, someone wants to know really quick, what type of camera do you have, Nicole? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I have the uh, Canon, they're correct. <laughs> uh, I have the Canon. It's the uh, point and shoot version. It's the G7X. It's actually an older camera. I need to get a new one. So uh, Tim and I are gonna talk about what I have. I have shot in the past mirrorless camera, the Sony A6000, and I've also shot um, a, uh, a Canon um, DSLR, but I just found that when I had the bigger cameras, it was harder for me because I'm constantly like, chasing around students and, <laughs> and and diving you know with people that I just found that this was easier to just strap to me. I usually have two strobes, but unfortunately last Thursday, one of my strobes fell on the boat deck and it exploded. So I'm down to one strobe. So uh, if you guys can all give me a, a, a tear sign on the uh, comment section, like poor strobe. Anyways, but I use the uh, Fantasy Line housing um, we sell these at 4C. What's great about these is um, they have double O-rings inside. So let me open that. So as you can see, here is the O-ring on the um, on the door, and then there's a second O-ring here. There's also I'm not sure if it works anymore, but like I said, my camera's old. The but there's a one. there's a moisture sensor, and of course, mine doesn't work anymore. So, yep, I'm in need of a new camera. I've beat this thing up for the last uh, five years, so it's time for an upgrade. <laughs> All right. So, so you've done it, but you've done a great job with that of not flooding <laughs> that camera for many years. Yeah. <laughs> Believe me, I've had my fair share of flooded cameras. <laughs> All right. Tim's going to go ahead and answer that question about strobe positioning. Sure. So, um, of course, for general strobe positioning, we're going to um, for uh, assume we're going to talk about wide angle. And generally, that means the lens is pretty wide. So using a dome port in this scenario, a really important thing for reducing the backscatter is making sure the strobes are behind the dome. Because if they're in front of the dome, there's a good chance they might end up in the photo, and that means that the light might be refracting back directly at the lens. And this creates all sorts of issues on top of illuminating all of the water directly in front of the camera. And that's what you really want to avoid when you talk about proper strobe positioning. Um, proper strobe positioning is 
lighting your subject that is maybe 18 inches in front of you without lighting the water between the front of your camera and the subject itself. Because that is where the backscatter lies that will end up being in front of the photo and causing issues with the you know the photo looking very nice. So as Nicole will probably not ask me to draw again, um, <laughs> I will say, so this is the dome. So as you can see, this is uh, the strobe right here that also has a, a diffuser on it. I drew that because a diffuser on your strobe also really helps with uh, getting rid of the backscatter. As you can see, this strobe does not have a diffuser. It's not on there. And this is Ike Light's uh, standard diffuser. They make a dome diffuser that's really great also. And then of course, this is the CNC strobe with the diffuser. So the diffuser helps too, and they come in different shapes and sizes. And uh, so if you imagine how wide your beam of light is coming off of your strobe, they're all different, but for roundabout sake, they're around 100 degrees wide. So the, the edge of light, as you can see, is traveling along the dotted line and it just hits the subject. So all that water in between does not get illuminated. So for example, this other strobe next to it is not properly positioned. So as we draw that line of its where the light would go, it misses the subject. What that means is all of the backscatter right there is going to be in your photo. So that strobe was wrong. And that strobe was right. So I know that can be a little confusing, but I'm not that good at drawing. But I'm very good at talking about it and helping people uh, understand it in person. <laughs> and having your system in front of you, I'm actually going to take Nicole's right now um, and just kind of demonstrate really quickly. If we imagine there was a dome port on here. I told you it needs, I need a new one. <laughs> so if you look, the front of the port and the le the strobe is behind it. You can't see the strobe. If the strobe was out in front, then that would be wrong for wide angle. For macro, different story. Macro is not really the concern with backscatter uh, as much because you're really not illuminating nearly as much water. It's wide angle where you're illuminating so many gallons of water in front of you, uh, and that's where the backscatter generally uh, comes from. And actually, uh, if you're somebody who wants only one strobe, mm -hmm. so go ahead and show them how you put the strobe over the top. Yeah, so of course, and that also is something when people are getting involved, two strobes is you know a little more advanced, so starting with one is very popular. And it gives you actually a lot of creative control when you're using one strobe, because you have to then accept the shadows that you're gonna create. Two strobes, generally, the rule is, the purpose of that is to illuminate, to reduce the shadows. <laughs> yep. I need some WD-40 on those. Uh... <laughs> Nicole's system is a little, I've seen better days. <laughs> so we're going to use Coco as the there as the macro subject here. So if so, you're doing one strobe and you you're trying to... You can go off of center. Sometimes you'll try to go off of the center if you have one strobe. And that'll give you the ability to get some sort of even lighting, especially if you hit the stroke, if the subject straight on, um, or you accept that the subject is maybe coming from the left or right if it's a moving subject. So then you point your strobe accordingly, and you accept the shadows that it creates. Also, a lot of divers really like this solution with one strobe because it's one strobe, and then on the other side you can add on your dive light, uh, focus light, or even a video light, uh, and and that can help fill in and reduce those shadows, uh, and also doubles as a, a video light now. So if you have a system that's capable of doing both, you can do some you know, modest video with the one light as well, and have a truly versatile system underwater. <laughs> so if you don't have a cocoa, make sure you come into 4C and get one. <laughs> awesome. OK. And I'm going to show you guys a few more photos now real quick, something more fun. Great. So um, this is something, too, that um, is really important to think about <clears throat> because you get you get complacent sometimes. The, the housings are built to be held 
horizontally. So swapping vertically means repositioning your strobes, adjusting, getting used to it, but do it. Get vertical, especially when the, when the shot warrants it. You get some really nice compositions. Of course, you can make fake vertical shots by cropping and making it as if it were vertical, but with a lot of cameras, when you crop too much, you lose a lot of megapixels in your image, and then you're losing all the information. So in that sense, it's always best to fill your frame with your subject so you crop less and take advantage of vertical. And uh, it can be a lot of fun. And then you have a lot of different lighting, uh, uh, lighting opportunities there too. And of course, try to tell a story. Uh, that's always something to consider uh, when you're underwater um, taking photos. Uh, video is uh, uh, truly amazing underwater as well and tells stories in a much different way. So when you try to tell a story with a photo, it can be a really fun challenge for yourself. And then you can try to come back with something unique. And we have more questions. Um, someone's Ready? asking about how to uh, take care of your system. Um. Uh, right, yes, this is really important when you uh, when you uh, get into underwater photography, accepting the maintenance that comes with that if you if you want your system to treat you well. Um, the salt, as we all know, is very corrosive. So cleaning your system, uh, drying it, and properly caring for it is going to help your system live a nice long life, as Nicole's did, served for many, many years. As you see, it's just acting up on us today a little bit. But um, uh, yeah, it's something, you know, proper maintenance. Um, even fresh water has mineral deposits that get left behind on the housing. Um, so drying your system, thoroughly rinsing it, being really careful about shared camera buckets. Uh, it can be a really dangerous place for your camera. Um, I also like to push uh, the buttons in fresh water uh, to help flush out salt water that has maybe gotten into some of those buttons. Uh, but of course, make sure the camera's off. You don't want to start hitting all the buttons on your housing when the camera's on, because then you could, uh, you could end up erasing images or setting up an auto bracketing mode and not understanding why your camera isn't working properly. Um, okay, and how many times should you uh, clean the O-ring every mm. after every dive, after every other dive? Uh, what are your thoughts on O-ring cleaning? So this is a, a very hot button issue. Um, as I learned using equipment that I did not own, we had a procedure. So we did the O-ring every day, and you inspected the O-ring anytime you opened it during the day. Because generally, once a day should be plenty, especially if you leave your system closed and don't have to open it. A lot of systems don't require that. Uh, some, of course, some systems will need you to swap out a battery for your afternoon dives. Uh, so that can be expected, and you just... You can do so, and you just have to be. You always have to check your O-ring every time you open it. Um, but we would clean and take out, clean and remove the O-ring every day, and we would then clean it, dry it, and then apply new lubrication. And then also, of course, remove all the excess silicone from the housing. You don't want to leave that behind either. But <laughs> some people also don't follow all those rules and have lots of success and don't change their O-rings or do it often at all. But <laughs> When especially uh, when you learn in a professional setting, it just becomes uh, part of your routine. And I always check my O-ring. I might make it an extra dive or two without changing it because I'll do a really good thorough visual inspection. Also, I have a I, my housing is Nauticam, and uh, Nauticam has the uh, vacuum system, which is a very great safety tool for leak detection and helping to prevent those leaks to give you the peace of mind that you've prepared your system properly. So I have a little bit of a luxury there uh, where I don't have to, I'm not as worried about flooding. Uh, I know that is a big concern that people have, especially if they have an expensive camera that they're gonna bring underwater for the first time. They, they don't wanna lose it and they wanna make sure they're properly putting it in that housing. So learning those right steps, and that's all part of the experience of when you, uh, you pick a local shop and you go and buy your equipment that they're gonna, they're gonna help you and they're gonna make sure you learn your equipment well and understand it so that you go out and use it and you come back with awesome dives and photos instead of a, a sad story of a flooded camera because that's that's no way to start your diving experience. So that's a key part of getting used, getting into it is taking it apart, putting it together, and then doing that three more times because you'd want to be able to do it underwater 
if something came apart that wasn't uh, wasn't going to get flooded. Okay, so everybody was really interested in the strobe positioning, and they just mm -hmm. want you to go over for positioning with a macro. Great, awesome. Shot. So um, I do some different types of macro. Um, I do a, a macro with my 105 at the bridge, and for that strobe positioning, there are so many options. We take the baby turtle. Coco. Coco. So Coco is in general, you know, the size of a lot of subjects at the bridge. Oh yeah, there we go. So of course if she's looking at you and you have two strobes, I will tend to do two strobes angled from that didn't work so well. Let me move my camera around a little. So, so for macro, this is kind of how my basic setup would be for one oh using the one oh five. Um, I will be even angled towards them. Sometimes I'll go like this, and you get really cool light that can bounce off of your subjects. Um, using the one oh five, you also would have a long macro port, and then maybe I would bounce the light off of the macro port, and then it would the light would bounce forward to your subject. Um, if you have an articulating arm system, you can turn it around and you can bring your strobe from behind and do backlighting. Um, with macro, there's so many opportunities and options for lighting that I always try to tell people to be creative. Um, you get people that'll they'll light it just like this, you know, straight out from the port. Um, generally, for macro, you're going to be much closer to your subjects, um, just because you know you're using smaller apertures so you need more strobe light to help uh, to, to help get the proper exposure and there's actually a tip that I've always uh, been told if you are trying to get that um, fill that screen with uh, the animal don't use your um, what's that called the the button that uh, the zoom don't use a zoom on your camera you use your fins to zoom, so you that's how you get closer and better because you want to be able to get that um, image so you're not cropped in and you get fuzzy images. So just remember, use your fins to zoom, don't use the button to zoom. That is a very good tip, Nicole, right? Say get closer is better than zooming because you, do, you lose image quality um, in certain scenarios when you zoom. So getting closer is always best. And also because your strobes, even the more powerful ones can only reach so far underwater. There's true limitations. Um, so strobe light images, you know, without being any further than six feet apart, um, is about the distance that a strobe can work at max max capacity underwater. In most scenarios. Okay, so they really want to know um, what about taking pictures of a person, say maybe next to the reef or like swimming above it, or just being able to get, get good photos of your buddy underwater. What's the yeah. uh, secret to that? So that is uh, comes down to planning with your buddy. You know, so talking to your dive buddy about this and and planning the dive is going to help with success a lot here. It's always good to have that diver um, also having like a a dive light, so they have. So they have light coming off of them, which helps add a depth to your image. Um, finding something nice for the diver to be next to, of course, like a nice coral or sponge or sea fan, or of course an, an animal is always great as well. Um, getting them very close, because you generally you want them to be close to that coral or fan so you can get them both well lit uh, with your strobe. And then try to go for something, of course, a third thing is best. You know, a third point of interest is always what makes a photo more appealing. So if you can add in a wreck in the background, or maybe the dive boat above, or a really defined sunburst, uh, which is you know, when you when the sun is really well defined in an underwater image, um, those adding in those thoughts to your photo and, and truly planning your shot gives you that ability to achieve something truly special, um, especially when doing a staged person photo because you have a whole dive with them, and as long as you communicate well, you can redo, you can ask them to make minor adjustments and a practice, uh, understanding skin tone and, and proper lighting and you know not overexposing your subject uh, is the best way to, is to make sure that your subject is um, happy with the results. And if you don't mind, I'm gonna jump in here with a couple of tips on that. Um, 
I think that photographing somebody with a clear mask skirt versus a dark, uh, like a black mask is actually much easier mm -hmm. because when you have the black mask, um, you tend to only light up one of the frames instead of the both frames because the black is like not allowing the light to penetrate. So if you really want to get photos of people underwater, tell them to wear a clear skirted mask. Um, also, biggest thing is the uh, communication with your subject um, because I always tell people when I jump before I jump in the water, I go, "Hey guys, I'm gonna take photos of you underwater." So when you see me go one, two, three, that's when I want you to. Inhale. inhale okay and the reason why is because if you exhale it's gonna be bubbles all over that person's face for that photo and especially if you have a point and shoot where you don't have the rapid fire like boom, 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 boom. if you only have a point and shoot you only get that one photo and then all of a sudden the person starts swimming off and you're like wait you blur you know there's bubbles in your face so um, that's one thing is to always talk to whoever is your dive buddy on the boat and say, listen, I'd love to take some photos of you next to a coral or a sea fan. Um, so when I go one, two, three, you know, go ahead and make that inhale. Um, also, I see that buddies tend to think it's fun to take their regs out and do pictures. Well, okay, that's fine. You have the skill set to do it, but think about this. When you take that regulator out, sorry, um, bubbles come and then if you don't turn the mouthpiece down then it's like and all these the bubbles and out of the way so then like it kind of ruins the shot too so if somebody really wants to do that remind them if you're going to do the out of the mouth shot tell, say take it out you know but you gotta blow some bubbles right because we don't hold our breath in scuba diving so no. um those are some things and then also it's all about positioning so like if i want them next to something i usually go i point at it and i say get with that for a picture. That's kind of my hand signal I give underwater and that helps them understand. And then I kind of do this like, come closer, come closer, oh, come, come closer. closer. And that's because you need to have that strobe light, not just the subject, like the coral piece or the sea fan, but I got to light their face. So if they're behind it at all, like the, the, the animal, right? If I'm the diver and if this is out in front, it's only going to light what's out in front and not get the light back here. So I gotta be on the same plane as whatever I'm having them take a photo with. So um, it's again, it's about positioning them. And if you've ever dove with me, ra uh, not raise your hand, but um, hit the uh, thumbs up button if you've ever dove with me underwater and I use this. And what do I do? I usually like poke you and say, get up there, come down there. And I, <laughs> So if you've ever been on a dive with me, give me a thumbs up. <laughs> if you've ever gotten your picture taken with me, give me a thumbs up. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, another thing uh, going to lighting, um, not necessarily with strobes, but if uh, you've got like say the GoPro um, mm -hmm. and you don't have a strobe or, or a light system, um, they have filters that you can use, right? So yes. can you tell people about those? <clears throat> yes, so filters are truly uh, a, a great thing to talk about. Um, and for beginners, they're great because uh, as we know, when you do your dive training, you learn that color, you lose red very quickly as you go underwater. And, once you hit 60 feet, there's almost none left whatsoever. Um, so the red filter is really great in these shallower depths up to around their 60 feet uh, without without adding on additional light, um, bringing back a lot of that true color. Now, of course, it's it's not perfect, and there's many different filters for different depths. GoPro is really great about having different depths for um, different filters. And uh, other brands also make some really good filters that help with this. And um, it is very useful. It has its limitations, of course. Uh, once you get deeper than 60 feet, you're really going to, you will struggle with the filter. But up to 60 feet, it is a great substitute and a great way to get started. Uh, if your light's not working, you know, that's no reason to cancel a dive. If you still have that red filter, it's a, it's a great backup solution. Um, some people like to use the red filter in addition to video lights and double, doubling on those efforts to bring out the true richness and color at the, some of those deeper dives. Um, that is some used by some. Uh, but yes, filter on the GoPro, I think is essential. Um, and then of course, adding on some video lights to your GoPro is really a great move too. Because those video lights will, if you maybe you know, grow past your GoPro and want something better, those video lights will still be able to grow with you because they'll be able to be used with any system. Video lights are universal generally. Awesome. Okay, we have somebody asking about shooting the Goliath groupers, like not shooting, like shooting, like shooting with your camera, the Goliath groupers. So 
Um, they're asking about like kind of what the depths are that these guys are hanging out and then what's the best way to get good Goliath grouper shots. Yes. So um, as we know, the, the Goliath grouper diving is considered an advanced dive in Florida generally. Um, and generally in deeper water in that 80 to 100 foot range, I believe they're predicted to be on the caster again this year and also on the Anna Cecilia. And then also they're always up on the wreck trek in Jupiter too and a couple other places but they don't hang out in just one spot. But I believe generally it's on this coast, it's almost always in deeper water where you see them. On the Gulf of Mexico, I know you can find them in shallower water sometimes um, and occasionally, but for the aggregation, it's always on that deeper water um, off the wrecks. Um, I'd say one of the best ways to, to have some success with photographing Goliath groupers if, uh, if you're planning on going this season would be to get a couple dives in beforehand. If you haven't dove in a year, I would say that that would be the most important thing you could do. Um, to get a practice dive in before you go, there could be strong currents when you get there. Um, and when the captain drops you and you're drifting and you're drifting at that wreck, you may only have a couple seconds to get in position to get that shot. Because after a couple seconds, there's going to be 10 more divers and you'll be 20 feet past the wreck and you won't be able to swim back if it's a really strong current, unless you have some sort of uh, a scooter to, to help you with that. That is also a great way to nail Goliath grouper shots would be to have a a, a dive propulsion vehicle uh, because its currents are really strong. Um, practicing on sharks uh, is a great similar. Of course, the Goliath is darker and not as reflective and shiny as sharks, but they're similar size and they will generally um, let you get similarly close to them. So that'd be a good way to practice. Um, also, a dive buddy is uh, can be similar to a Goliath grouper, so a dive buddy could be good to practice on too. <laughs> Awesome. Okay, guys. So I'm jumping in here and what we're going to do is we are going to do our raffle. Woohoo! So remember, guys, um, if you registered on our Eventbrite for this uh, particular presentation, uh, we're raffling off the Digital Underwater Photography Manual by Patty. And uh, basically, guys, uh, pretty much all of the photo pros that work at 4C, we are all certified to get um, to teach this course. And uh, I know there's some people that are asking very, um, very specific questions to us, and, and we appreciate the questions, but because not everybody has that camera and, and we're on a time crunch here, um, but we would love to talk to you more. So if you want, you can email us. It's photopros, all one word, photopros at force-e.com and you can maybe schedule to come in and meet with a photo pro and we can go over your system and see what else that you might need. Uh, we can schedule a class with you. Um, or like I said, um, if you're not interested in you know doing the photos but you want photos of yourself, uh, you can hire one of us and we'll go out diving with you and you can pose all around the dive and we will take photos all day long. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> it is a lot of fun. So all right guys, so I'm gonna go ahead and pull up we have our random name picker. Okay, let's uh, get that in here. All right, so as you can see, I'm gonna, I put everyone's um, emails in here and their names, and then we're going to hit this green button to pick a name at random. Here we go. And the winner is Kimberly Peterson. Hey. Kimberly, you are the uh, winner of our um, digital underwater photography manual, and you can pick this up at the one of our four Cs. I will be contacting you. You can tell me which four C is uh, easier to pick it up at, and uh, we'll get you started. And you can maybe take a class if you're interested. So um, a lot of great information in this book, um, and we, there's a lot of other. Um, information um there's other tutorials that you can do but really i mean i'll be honest hold on let me get back here i'll be honest uh you know going out and and hiring one of us to help you is going to be the key because we're going to give you not just the basics but we're going to give you little tips and tricks to not just uh photography but to your specific system i mean the one-on-one -on -one attention yeah and and we'll even help you like achieve some shots that maybe you've been thinking about getting and you haven't been able to get those so you know give you some shot um some angles creative. yeah some creativeness some stuff that maybe you want to enter in a competition yeah and there's always um a great wealth of knowledge and i'm gonna go ahead and uh there is an underwater there's the south florida underwater photography 
Um, it's a dive club here in South Florida that gets together once a, once a month. Well, right now, because of COVID, they're doing online. But um, if you're interested in that um, club, go ahead and look at them up. And uh, there's so many great photographers. Some of these photographers in this club, um, they publish books that we have here at 4C. We have Under the Blue Heron Bridge. Um, we have the uh, Blackwater Night Diving Critter book. Um, I mean, just some of the amazing photographers. And you learn a lot from them. So get out there and go diving. Uh, we'll definitely help you get the shots you want. So give us a call or like I said, you can email us at photopros, photopros at force-e.com. So guys, thank you all for tuning in. Tim, thank Nicole. you. Thank And thank you, Nicole. Thank you guys so much. It was really great. Um, I'll do my best. I might uh, pop into the comments later and try to answer some of them. So I know they'll be up, uh, they'll be up on Facebook. And uh, hopefully we'll see you guys out on the boat and do some diving. Yeah. All right, guys. Give us a call. See you later. Bye.